John Romero's Daikatana is a PC game from the year 2000 developed by Ion Storm. We've talked about him on this channel a few times already, but for those of you who are still under a rock, John Romero is one of the most influential video game developers of all time. As one of the founding members of id Software, John Romero is also one of the founding fathers of the first-person shooter genre. The id games Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, and Quake changed the landscape of gaming forever artistically, technologically, and developmentally. However, despite all of their success, the original team at id Software began to break up. <laughs> Founding member Tom Hall left the team in 1993, and Romero followed in 96. And that decision of, you know what, let's just slap Doom weapons in this engine and call it a game. I was just like, you know what, this isn't the same place anymore. So I was basically done. After the quake was done, I was done. The duo would then start a new studio in late 1996 called Ion Storm. With the new studio came the announcement of a new game called Die Katana. And with Romero's track record of creating revolutionary games, the studio's publisher, Edios Interactive, basically gave him a blank check for the project. Originally, the development of Die Katana was just supposed to take seven months, utilizing the Quake engine. And while that is a very short time to develop a game from the ground up, it was not hard to believe this goal would be met with two X id software superstars at the helm of the ship. But that's not what happened. Dai Katana faced multiple delays and endured a challenging development process with only two staff members staying on board throughout the game's production. Over 20 staff members quit during development and at one point nine quit simultaneously. Additionally, after months of development, John Romero decided to switch the game's engine to the Quake 2 engine, resulting in mountains of lost work. During development, Ion Storm's advertising campaign was ridiculously edgy, with magazine spreads stating, John Romero's about to make you his bitch. <laughs> Romero later apologized for these ads, acknowledging his regret for allowing them to be published. Regardless of the development issues and the tone-deaf ad campaign, Daikatana was still massively hyped. So when it finally dropped in 2000, how was it received? What the fuck is this piece of shit? Today, the game is widely regarded as one of the biggest commercial flops in video game history. It suffered from outdated graphics, a low frame rate, and jarring sound effects upon release. However, these issues paled in comparison to the game-breaking bugs caused by the faulty artificial intelligence. Before sitting down to record for this video, I had never played Daikatana. Back in 2000, I had heard about the game and how it was an epic fail, so I stayed clear. Now that I'm making videos for YouTube, I decided to play this game with the goal of asking myself at the end, is Daikatana really as bad as everyone says. You see, when a highly anticipated game fails to meet expectations upon release, it often faces emotional review bombing. However, after 23 years, Die Katana currently sits as mixed reviewed on Steam. I've been intrigued by the many positive reviews this game has considering I've heard nothing but horror stories. So in this video, I will review Die Katana objectively, putting aside any biases and preconceived opinions I may have. Throughout my playthrough, I will determine whether Die Katana is truly as bad as it is said to be, so let's dive into the game and see if John Romero will make me his biatch. About time. I'm ready for some action. The game starts by introducing us to Hiro Miyamoto, a sword master. One day, he is randomly visited by a sick old man named Toshiro Ibihara, who tells Hiro that reality has been distorted by an evil time manipulator named Kage Mishima, who had found a sword that Hiro's ancestor had made generations earlier. The sword, now known as the Dai Katana, gave Mishima the ability to time travel, and with it, he warped reality into a dystopian nightmare. Toshiro begs Hiro to save his daughter from the evil Mishima and to take back the Dai Katana to fix the disrupted timeline. Out of nowhere, ninjas attack and kill Toshiro and knock out Hiro. But they don't kill him because plot armor. Choosing to believe this wild time travel story, Hiro decides to avenge this random guy he just met and he hides in a coffin because apparently in the future, dead bodies are just stuffed in coffins and kind of taken away and dumped in a swamp. Yeah, that makes sense. This entire opening cinematic is nearly 10 minutes long. It's full of info, I found myself kind of zoning out of the majority of it, and I only really understood the plot when I rewatched the video to write this script. Off to a great start. When I set out to play this game, I was going to play it in the latest patched vanilla version. However, I was struggling to enjoy myself because the game was not in a 1080p resolution. After some internet sleuthing, I found a fan patch that put the game in 1080p. Apparently, John Romero gave the source code to fans and they fixed a ton of issues with Dai Katana. Now, I did not read the fan patch notes, and I was significantly into the game before I realized the fan patch had made the AI companions invincible. From what I understand, the retail version of the game 
if the bot companions died, your game would end. I can only imagine how frustrating this was for players back in the year 2000, because as you're about to find out, the bot AI in this game is atrocious. So, the point I'm making is I ended up sticking with the fan patch version of the game for this playthrough, and while it may not be the most authentic experience, I still think I got a very good taste of what Daikatana has to offer. Here's where the real fun begins. The first thing I noticed about this game is it felt a lot like Quake 2. It was fast and responsive, and this makes sense considering the game was built with the Quake 2 engine. The game is a shooter, but as you play, you gain experience and can level up attributes for your character. So the game is kind of an RPG. Chrono Trigger and Zelda were Daikatana's main influences, and so that is why we have some RPG elements in this game. Alright, I'm not the biggest fan of RPG elements in first-person shooter games, so we're not off to the best start. That's alright, maybe there will be some fun enemies to fight. Hey look, robot frogs! Robot mosquitoes! And robot crocodiles! Alright, I don't have an issue with the robotic aesthetic, but for me the problem with these enemies is they just make you look all over the place to shoot them. This wouldn't be an issue normally, but it's compounded because the first gun, the ion cannon's projectile, is so small it seems to need pinpoint accuracy to hit anything, and the projectile can also just bounce off surfaces and hurt you. It also can't be shot underwater because the coating just thinks the projectile is bouncing back at you, forcing the player to use their melee weapon in the swimming sections unless, of course, you want to under alive yourself. After eating an ungodly amount of health berries, I got through the first stage and came upon a door that Hero can't pass. Then suddenly a ghost appears. After Hero's dead ancestor helps him through the door, we fight more frogs and mosquitoes and come across these guys. After fighting through sewers, tunnels, and a detention facility, you come across Superfly Johnson, an ex-security officer who wants revenge on Kage Mishima, the bad guy we're trying to track down, and he joins the quest. Superfly is an AI-controlled sidekick who will now play alongside you. Alright, how bad could it be? In order to complete a stage, Superfly has to be with you. This would be fine, except he gets stuck on everything, even stairs. Hero needs to complete puzzles and level traversal with a sidekick who easily gets lost or stuck in every minute of play. This causes you to have to double back constantly to look for your sidekick and where he got stuck, making levels last much longer than they probably needed to. You can also command the sidekick to come to you, stay, and pick up items. From my experience, only the stay command really worked, and honestly quite literally nudging the companion was the best way to get them to move. But every time you bump him, you're sure to hear about it. You like pushing me around. Superfly does use weapons as well, and he will help you fight. His accuracy is pretty spot on, but apparently in Vanilla there was friendly fire and the sidekick could actually damage the player. Considering that Superfly is often behind you, I can only imagine how awful this was. You like pushing me around. So the patch I am playing on removed friendly fire and made my AI companion invincible to keep them from dying all the time. Sounds like I saved myself a ton of anguish. There are four episodes in this game, and the weapons are different for every episode. I will touch more on this later, but the weapons in the first episode all have insane splash damage and could kill the player quickly. Half the time, I felt I was more dangerous to myself than the enemies. Daikatana is a hard game, but I don't contribute that to the brilliant design choices by the developers. It's more the opposite. Bad design choices is what makes this game difficult. My first example of this is what I call door fights. These first few levels have way too many doors with the enemies right behind them that would shoot you the moment the door opened. These levels were filled with undynamic fights in doorways where I would either splash damage myself or Superfly would somehow f up the fight for me. These door fights prompted unavoidable damage, which as I played I discovered was a purposeful design element of Dai Katana. Open a door. Surprise damage! Crawling through a vent. Surprise mini gun turret damage! Not to mention all the traps in later levels. And while I'm not against unavoidable damage in games, I do think a game needs to give players something to balance against the damage. The reason unavoidable damage is so bad in Daikatana is that there are just not enough health pickups in the levels. And between that and the constant splash damage, I felt like I was always running at low health. I can't even imagine how frustrating this was for people back in 2000 playing Daikatana with just a few save gems per level. Oh yeah, the original game had a terrible save system where you could only save if you picked up an item in the game called a save gem, and there were only a few gems per level. Save gems were later patched out of the game and replaced by an unlimited save system because players hated the original 
original system so much. Now, I know when I started this video, I said I'd try not to be biased about Daikatana knowing the game's history. However, as I played it, I found it close to impossible to not scoff at almost everything. I will say, though, that the level design and the environments in this game are very well done, and I found myself genuinely enjoying the levels. Unfortunately, it was the combat, the puzzles, the AI companions, and other gameplay elements put into these levels that brought everything down. And the sound design. Oh god, the sound design. <laughs> Repetitive sounds are constant in Dai Katana. From a buzzing mosquito to a room full of robots, your ears will be constantly tortured playing this game. Even the character's melee weapon makes constant lawnmower sounds. Eventually, you and Superfly will find Toshiro's daughter. Remember the old man from the opening cutscene? After rescuing her, she also decides to join the quest, meaning that you now have two sidekicks you get to shove around the levels. Stop pushing me around. And somehow, Mikiko's AI is actually worse than Superfly's. The bulk of the rest of the game consists of escort missions with two AI companions that can't even walk downstairs. By this point, the game had become such a slog for me to get through, I was considering giving up. I felt like I had more than enough information to create a video, but honest to god, I was actually morbidly curious to see where this dumpster fire was headed. But considering Daikatana takes about 15 hours on average to finish and after rescuing Mikiko I had less than 4 hours put into the game so far, I was struggling to justify playing this game for another 11 hours. So I did something that normally I would be ashamed of, but in this instance I'm kinda oddly proud of myself. I, I turned on god mode. Because if I was gonna force myself to play the rest of this game, I felt like I needed to do it quickly and just power through the content. So I guess that answers the question if this game is good or not. But I finished the game, so now I have to finish the video. After a bit more companion babysitting, you will finally arrive at the Dai Katana, which is suspended in some glass case, and you will have to blow up some alien brains to free it. Because that makes sense. Once you grab the Dai Katana, you win! Just kidding! Kage Mishima shows up holding another Dai Katana, and the two of you monologue instead of fight. This is because... These two swords are actually one and the same. If they were ever to cross or touch in any way, the world as we know it would cease to exist. You were then sent back in time, and you land in ancient Greece, but not normal Greece, mythological Greece. As I said earlier, there are four episodes in this game, and each episode takes place in a different time period. Different environments, different enemies, and different weapons. You start over in every episode, keeping your RPG stats and the Daikatana. All in all, it's an astonishing amount of content, almost like four games in one. That would be great if the game was not such a mess, but instead the game feels like a grind, and that is why I turned on God Mode. In all honesty, it really is a shame, because given proper development, I think this game could be quite fun. Anyways, with the Daikatana in hand, you now slay spiders, skeletons, and more in this ancient Greece timeline. The sword levels up as you kill, making it more powerful, which is a great concept, except for the fact that the melee is just so janky. Half the time, you don't know if you're hitting anything, and in melee mode, you take so much damage. Honestly, the game is so fast and the movement is so fluid, there's really no reason to do melee at all. I mean, look at the speed! With these amazing movement mechanics, it's a shame that there are not more open shooting spaces in this game, as most of the maps are just tight corridors. After Hero finds Makiko, you continue through the episode with more puzzles than their previous levels. The puzzles were not bad per se, but my biggest issue with them was how obscure some of them were. Oftentimes you'd be left guessing on what to do or what to click, buttons had no indicators they were buttons, and oftentimes you'd walk over a spot that was supposed to trigger something and it wouldn't, leaving you to wander around until you came back and triggered it eventually. We are playing what should be a fast and smooth FPS game, but instead we are babysitting AI companions who get stuck on stairs, trying to solve puzzles to open doors with zero indication on what to do or where to go in a game that has a very quick time to kill and weapons that do a ton of self damage. I'm sure you could imagine the frustration this game can induce. I like pushing me around. After battling our way through temples and caves, we finally land in Medusa's lair. I actually really enjoyed this episode's level design, and I think the map layouts and aesthetics are the strongest part of this game. I turned off god mode for this battle, and I still managed to kill Medusa in seconds. Then we find Superfly, who's turned to stone, we use Medusa's life force to charge the Dai Katana, and travel back in time to stop Mishima again. When we're in the vortex of time, our bad guys there waiting for us. Hiro and Kage swing their swords around despite being told that if the swords touch, the universe would be destroyed. But who cares about plot holes at this point? 
After being defeated, Hero and friends are sent to the medieval time period. The kingdom has been taken over by bubonic plague zombies called buboids, and the king has gone insane. You are instructed by some priest guy to find pieces of the king's sword and to reassemble him to make the king better. At some point, Makiko gets bitten by a rat and Superfly carries her around. You will also need to fight wizards. Despite yet more esoteric puzzles, more janky bugs, and boss fights that were way too easy, again, I enjoyed the environments, the aesthetic, and the unique weapons. Check this one out. We find the sword pieces, assemble them, give them to the king. The king heals Makiko and launches the heroes back into time yet again. Now we're in San Francisco in 2030 on Alcatraz Island to be precise. With modern weapons we somehow acquire in prison, we fight super buff prisoners, then attempt to parkour out of prison. When the AI companions finally make it out, you have to escape the island by fighting all the military dudes guarding the island, and sharks. Yes, sharks. You finally steal a boat and promptly crash it right next to Mishima's headquarters. Since you're not injured at all, you assault the base. And while the shoulder mounted cannon weapon is really cool, the rest of this area is horrible. I experienced more jank with Mikiko's AI than I care to talk about, so for the sake of our sanity and the length of this video, we are going to skip ahead. Eventually, we have a showdown with Mishima at the submarine dock, and this is how that fight went. Hey, I even turned off God Mode, okay? My assumption is that because the game is so long, by the time I got to the boss fight, my character was so grossly overpowered due to the RPG system. And while the stat balance is the least of this game's problems, I think it's safe to say the game may be ridiculously overpowered by the end of it. With the Daikatana safe and sound, you're ready to put the timeline straight. But wait, there's more! Mikiko steals the sword and kills Superfly. You fight her and goes something like this. You set the timeline straight once and for all, reviving your failed idiot companions in the process, then take to a life of meditation. Except you stole the Mona Lisa for some reason. The end! So in conclusion, is Dai Katana as bad as they say it was? Yes, I think so. While it did have interesting weapons, movement mechanics, and level design, the bad puzzles, stale combat, ear-splitting sound effects, bugs, and horrible artificial intelligence overshadowed any good about this game. I also did not even talk about the game crashing half a dozen times. It was an infuriating experience to slog through even with God Mode on, and I can't imagine what it would have been like for people back in the day who had to deal with the AI companions dying all the time and the save gym system. All in all, I'm glad I got to experience this piece of gaming history, even if it was just to roast it in a video. But now that I have, I think Dai Katana will go back to the depths of my Steam library where it belongs. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this look at Dai Katana. Have you played this legendary game? And what are your thoughts about it? Feel free to leave a comment and we'll chat about it. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed and subscribe if you haven't already. I'm Salty Octopus, and I'll see you next time.